Thank you for listening to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. Sign up to our Patreon to receive bonus content, live streams and our weekly newsletter with money off books and museum visits as well. Plus early access to all live show tickets. That's patreon.com slash we have ways. Achtung, achtung. Welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk USA with me, Al Murray, and of course, John McManus. James is, maybe he'll join us, maybe he won't. Maybe it's my time, my time now. It's my time. I've been away all this time, John. And finally, my time has come where I get to pick your brains without Jim interrupting me, which I think I'm very excited. Actually, don't let, if Jim arrives too, too bad, what do you say, John? Should we just fill our boots? I, I think if Jim arrives, we just lock him out. And so he can just pound on the door and <laughs> we'll say, sorry, you missed your window. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, um, how are you, John? Because I've not seen you in a while and because um, I've been busy um, acting, which has now stopped. And I'm doing great. But I've been listening to, to you and Jim. And I, I found, uh, was it James Fenelon who you talked to about um, 11th Airborne? I, I found that absolutely fascinating. And to hear other perspectives on the Airborne thing and particularly to to try and place the Pacific in the center of that wing of the American army, you know, that that I think, I mean, you're a great advocate for the fact that actually, by the way, it was the US army that won the Pacific war. Absolutely. Rather than Marine Corps. <laughs> it played, it, the army played such an enormous role in the Pacific. Yeah. And, and I, I just, I, I keep banging this drum because it's, there's just this sort of Marine centric view, yeah. especially yeah. in this country. Oh, well here, I think, I, I think if you, you know, because we're we're at a further remove. The the fact that people don't really know much about our own Eastern theatre stuff, the idea that they'd have any grip on your Eastern theatre stuff, I think is um or Pacific theatre stuff is, you know, fanciful really. Anyway, but we were going to talk today about Joseph Warren Stillwell. Now, this is fantastic as a topic because he is one of these American protagonists in, in the Second World War who did rub up rub up against the British quite considerably in his time. So for those who don't know who he is, thumbnail of his career, and then we'll then we'll, we'll talk deeper about him. Yeah, so Stillwell is a West Pointer. He uh, graduated yep. one year behind MacArthur, so he graduates in 1904. All right. uh, he, he was actually from Yonkers, New York, which is really not far at all from West Point. Um, and he, uh, he, he kind of makes his way partially as an infantry officer, uh, but he also has this incredible facility with languages. In World War I, he has. A, he actually gets uh, a disability, but not from combat. He was too close to uh, like a depot explosion, and it cost him almost all the sight in his left eye. Right. Yeah. So what happened is that he could maybe, if he put his hand like three feet in front of his face, he could maybe make out some of the shapes through his left eye. So there was a great deal of strain on his right eye, and he's famous, of course, for wearing glasses. Yeah. In World War II, which not that many generals really did. No, you don't uh, see that, do you? No. You don't. And and uh, so by then, he had really had a, quite an interesting career by World War II because he was sort of the Army's primary language instructor. He was a Spanish teacher at West Point, but he also had French skills and, of course, most notably Chinese. And he spent a lot of time in China um, as military attache and whatnot and picked up a lot of the language and, and uh, the ability to write Mandarin, I think. And so... In World War II, he's sent to uh, by FDR to uh, to work with Chiang Kai-shek and the Nationalists. But he was really almost sent to command Operation Torch. In fact, that was the first job that was earmarked for him, and then they moved him to the to the China billet, which I think was fortuitous, but also you know obviously fraught with a lot of difficulties too. So one of the things I say about him is that at the same time he was perfect for that job in China. He was also the worst person on some levels too. So he's this interesting dichotomy. I mean, because because he's Uncle Joe to some people and Vinegar Joe to others, isn't he? It's, it's the truth. So his reputation, his leadership style is kind of you know he's into the average soldier. He's not he's not a disciplinarian. So so he's he's not a bullshit guy, which I think which I think is quite mm. interesting. Um, given given his reputation amongst his you know his his command peers that he's a pain in the ass. Um, the, the fact that to his men, he isn't seen as that, I think is, is an interesting contrast, isn't it? Yeah, he has no patience for frivolity, for suck-ups, for yep. uh, flowery language or anything like that. He was, he was actually one of the primary infantry instructors at what was then Fort Benning uh, in the 1920s. He was very close with General Marshall, George Marshall, 
And it's one of the reasons why Stilwell is always going to be kind of front of mind. You know, once World War One breaks out, Marshall's going to do a lot, I think, to protect him. Um, so yeah, is, I mean, is he one of Marshall's guys rather than MacArthur's? So he's he's with that generation of people, right? Definitely. Okay. Now he knows MacArthur, um, and and they get along okay. They had a kind of a wary respect, I think. But MacArthur really doesn't figure much in Stillwell's career until very, very late in the game. Uh, you know, this is after Stillwell was gone from China and after uh, Simon Bolivar Buckner gets killed on Okinawa as the commander of the 10th Army. Stillwell gets that army. And uh, so at that point, Stillwell has some interaction with MacArthur, but that's really about it. Now, Stillwell was really in Marshall's orbit um, for, for most of his career. And it's really at Fort Benning that they, they get quite close and that Marshall came to, to view Stillwell as just a remarkable person. And there was a lot of truth to that. Yeah. Um, so why is he, why is, I mean, obviously it's kind of unanswerable question, this, but his, his, his ability with languages is the, is the thing that forces him in, sends him to China in the end, isn't it? It's that although he doesn't want to go and he wants a command in Europe as you've, as, or in the Western theaters, you pointed out, they can't send anyone else, can they? Because he knows he knows China, he knows the Chinese, he can speak Chinese, which which is obviously incredibly important to, to that kind of posting. It's got to be him, hasn't it, really? The Americans haven't got anyone else they can really send, can they, to at least show they're serious, right? Not on the Army side of the house. I mean, the, <clears throat> the Navy has its uh, folks there, too, at a, not as high-ranking as Stillwell, and, and in some ways they're more successful in working with the nationalist government. But uh, the interesting thing that happens, Al, is that initially the War Department and the Army chose Hugh Drum to go to China. And Drum sort of like talks his way out of the job, in, not in the sense of saying, I don't want it, but he keeps like asking, well, what about this? And what about that? And what about uh, this? Can, what happens if I do that? Will I have this? And, and so it gets to the point where Marshall is just like, Okay, I, I'm just I'm just done with you. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm sidetracking you. And of course, as things turn out, uh, Drum is retired off, and then you know he's Fort Drum is named for him today. But that's about it. The only reason we know him. So Stillwell then is moved over from the torch slot to now go to to China. So this is in really early 1942 that he that he goes there and hooks up with Chiang Kai Shek. Um, so the, then he's wearing all these different hats once he comes in theater. He's the commander of American forces in CBI, China, Burma, India. He's chief of staff to Chiang Kai-shek and his like military advisor, sort of. He runs the Lend-Lease program. So it's a very complex posting, but he doesn't really control all that much in the way of like major American military forces. Yeah. Oh, and one of the problems is that oh, he is... Oh, James, welcome. Look who's here. <laughs> yes, and one of, the, one of the problems with Stillwell is, is that he is Vinegar Joe, isn't it? He's not called Vinegar Joe for... For nothing. I mean, you know, he's he's not a natural diplomat in a post which requires... He's not, but he's also, he loves China and he loves the people and the culture and he, he has such a belief in China and the, like the average soldier could be great if he's led properly and supported properly. And he's he has such a passion for the place and yet he has zero tolerance for the, the sort of the diplomatic BS, but also... The corruption. So, so mm. still will have he was so preternaturally honest that he, he was one of these people who's honest and kind of incorruptible and couldn't fathom anybody who wasn't that way. Yeah. And so so the, there's where the vinegar Joe comes out, because he had this really kind of venomous side, too. Um, but, but, but he's also, <laughs> you know, calls a spade a spade, isn't he? And I mean, you know, he doesn't he doesn't suffer fools and. You know, he 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 might love Chinese culture, but he's come into a kind of sort of a, a nest of vipers, hasn't he? Well, it? yes. So I mean, it, you know, the situation Chiang Kai Shek finds himself in. I mean, the the complexities of the of the Chinese war against Japan and its internal civil divisions and its divisions within its divisions. You know, I mean, it, the, the keeping just a lid on the nationalist movement and keeping it moving and keeping that war sustained and the really difficult decisions uh, he has, Chang has to make along the way. You know, no wonder he presents a, a, a complex face to, to Stillwell as the war progresses, mm-hmm. because he's in incredibly difficult waters himself. You know, that's even before you factor in that Mao's breathing down his neck, or is he, or is he aligned with him, or is he not? You know, that this whole thing, you, there are, I think there are honest reasons for the Chinese being a frustrating partner, aren't there? Well, absolutely. And let's not forget, I mean, they've been suffering and dying long before the Americans have, Yeah. Um, you know, since 1937 or before. 
they're from so from Chiang Kai Shek's point of view, he's been fighting this war, and the Americans are kind of the Johnny Come Latelys, and he's doing the the bleeding and dying for them in the same way the Soviets are in the European theater in a way. You know, so yeah, and, and you've got this very complex situation in China in which there's a civil war going on too, and not just between the nationalists and the communists, but between what we'll call the accommodationists, I guess, because Japanese occupied China has its own, you know, Chinese government as well under Zheng Wing Wei, uh, who kind of see themselves as the legitimate China, sort of like Vichy France or whatever. It's just a mess. Well, they're the, they're the third uh, leg on, on that sort of Chinese stool, and since disappeared from the story completely because the. Because after all, you know, Taiwan is what's left of old nationalist China, and 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 obviously Mao enters the ascendant after the war. So there, even remembering that that's a, a piece piece of the picture is is important. So no wonder Stillwell's kind of going, I need a straight answer off you guys, and can't get one. How important is the Chinese that are fighting for you know on the side of the Japanese? I mean, how how big a part of it is it? It's it's at least a third of China. Because the Japanese control all the seaports, they control most of eastern China, they control Manchuria. And so the Chinese in that area, among the governmental structure, view themselves as the legitimate China, the one that realistically understands it must work as a partner with Japan in the future. So they view Chiang Kai-shek and Mao as sort of outlaws, sort of in the same way, really, again, the Vichy comparison really works because um, it's a civil war and the Vichyites weren't all fascists. Many of them thought, well, no, we're the legitimate government and this is our reality. And as time goes on, we'll negotiate portions of our country back under our control from the Germans. And I think that it was the same sort of mindset in China. Now, there's if there's one thing and maybe the only thing that in the long term, the communists and the nationalists could agree on, it's that these guys in that other third of China were traitors, right? So, <laughs> so we've tended to erase them from history in that sense, too. But this was their dilemma. And, and John, how did the Japanese treat those Chinese? I mean, reasonably well at the governmental side, but of course, the treatment of the population was never good. Uh, it was always exploitive. It was always, you know, from a base point of, yeah, absolutely racist uh, against the average Chinese person. And of course, the the extrication of, chi- of Chinese resources and the control of Chinese seaports and all that, it was a very exploitive relationship. But the, the Japanese are smart enough to treat the elites well, I suppose. Um, and, and I would say, too, that's somewhat true on the nationalist and the communist side, too, where quite often you have these sort of uneasy kind of accommodation truces that go on sometimes among, say, a warlord affiliated with Chiang Kai-shek, um, you know, making truce with the Japanese or the communists who, who like to today make it seem like, oh, they did so much fighting. Actually, when you really look at it, they didn't do a lot of ground fighting. Um, they, they were wor- working their own movement in northern China and the areas were so remote, it was hard for the Japanese to control and there wasn't that much of value there. So it helps them grow their movement. And, and to go back to back to Stillwell, I mean, he's also he's he's competing with Claire Shano as well, isn't he, for, for influence oh, yeah. with Chang? I mean, I mean, l- 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 I mean, d- d- tell us a little bit about him because he's an extraordinary figure as well. Yeah, so Shano is another guy who who thinks of himself certainly as a great great friend of uh, of China and has has lived there a long time. Uh, has he, uh, the difference between Chenault and and Stillwell is Chenault gets along so much better with Chiang Kai Shek. And I think one of the reasons he gets along better is that Chenault is much more comfortable swimming in the Byzantine waters of, <laughs> of corrupt Chinese politics at this point. And that costs him prestige within the American military structure. Marshall once tells him, I don't trust you, you know, because he thinks of himself as sort of enriching himself. Um, and he's gone native, hasn't he? His, his, his interests aren't necessarily the US's interests. And-, and that's the concern. And of course, Stillwell would see that. Uh, and so he and Stillwell have two issues with each other that honesty, scale, which Stillwell thinks of Chenault as dishonest. And I'm not saying he is or isn't. I, I think that's for, for, you know, historians to decide, you know, anybody who reads into this, you think for yourself. But that's how Stillwell saw it. And then the other thing was the air power versus ground power thing. And that, in a way, is more interesting to me because Chenault is very, very much an air power advocate. And like many of them in that era, he oversells a great product. So he said he convinces FDR uh, in 1943, hey, we can we can win this war with just planes. Um, we, we can just bomb the heck out of the, the Japanese here and, and then in the in the waters around China. And, and I'm going to produce a victory, a, an ultimate victory over Japan for you. It's, it's a ridiculous argument. And what we really need is some big four engine bombers that have pressurized cabins that, that can fly at 40,000 feet. 
Yeah, I wonder what claim that would be. I know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. But, 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 but he's there because he's come with the, with this effectively a mercenary force, isn't it, of, of the Flying Tigers? Yeah, the Flying Tigers, yeah. And, and, and they are a mercenary force before the war. You know, they, which are these, these Kitty Hawks and, and War Hawks. Of course, once the war begins for the U.S., then they're called into active service. And so the dynamic changes a little bit. Um, and make no mistake, Chenault is a courageous guy. He's a fine aviator. And he's a very good leader, I think, a combat leader. Where he struggles, I think, is in the kind of grand strategy of overselling air power. Uh, and where he disagrees with Stillwell is the idea of having a campaign in northern Burma to open up that landward supply route. Chenault is saying we can fly our supplies in here, you know, with, through air power. And there's much to recommend that point of view, of course. But also, he, he he's the classic guy who's kind of, he's got greater influence than his rank would suggest he should have. Yeah, he's an emin- eminence grise, as you might say. Yeah, he's a bit like yeah. Ord Wingate in that Yeah, fact. It's interesting, though, because there are plenty of people overselling air, a great product, air power, aren't they? I mean, the the, war, the, the Second World War is absolutely chock full of people who, who are completely, I mean, completely convinced that they can win the war by air power alone. This, I mean, this is, this is the, the struggle that's, you know, after point blank. This is the, you know, the promise offered by Harris and Spots and all these people. IRC, all of these guys, they, they're absolutely convinced of it, aren't they? And, and but, I, but it's as much because they want it to be true, because they ultimately, I think it all is partly because that's their chosen field, but it's also because they want to save lives. They, they, they want to kind of negate the need for kind of vast armies getting slaughtered. Um, you know, all these guys are veterans of the First World War um, in some capacity or have seen its influence. So the, their reasons are perfectly honourable, I think. It's just... <laughs> The air power is so new, and it doesn't play out how how the the pre war predictions have have led them to yeah. believe. It seems to offer a better way of warfare in the future, right. less muck in the mud and whatever. But the, in on the case of the the American advocates, they also have another agenda. They want an independent air force, which yeah. of course makes great sense too. You can't blame them one bit. It makes no sense to have the air force part of the army, and they're dealing with that all the way. So that was kind of their agenda too, from Hap Arnold da- on down. And I think it's a motivator to kind of oversell the product. But also, this is the American way of war of saying, okay, well, you know what? Let's win at distance with firepower and material power and all that kind of stuff. So air is certainly your your main way to do it. Yeah, but John, I mean, it it is the American involvement in China and and China's part in the war is so written out of the narrative, it's not true. It's it's, 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 it's just not on people's radars at all. It should be. But the point is, is at the time, it's much more to the fore, isn't it? It's it's in the daily news reels and in the cinemas and stuff and in the newspapers much more than it is post-war. And, you know, I think I'm right, I'm right in saying that it's, it's absolutely key to Roosevelt's strategy, isn't it? You know, China is absolutely center to the strategy to defeat Japan. And, and we forget that. We forget how important it was in the United States. But I think, John, in talking about this, you've, you've glanced off two points of comparison. The, you know, it's like the Soviets doing the bleeding in Europe, the Ch- if you're Chinese. Then there's the Vichy element as well. And to place those in, our, in, in your imagination and understanding, is actually to put, as Jim's pointing out, is to put yourself back in 1942, which is how how people are seeing how these, you know, different plates are moving in this theatre. Because because we we t- in Britain we tend to view things through the prism of you know the failures failures of Singapore, Malaya, Hong Kong, and Burma, and then the Burma campaign as well, getting their act together and the largest defeat of the, of the Japanese army on land and all that stuff while still managing to ignore the Chinese taking part in the fighting in Burma and and talking about American air supply. But the, the, the hump always gets a footnote in the British sort of picture of what's happening in Burma. Well, uh, I think it's worth explaining how the hump operated. I mean, it's all those air, airfields in Assam, which is yeah. kind of northeast India. That You have this sort of out on a limb, you have Nagaland and Manipur State, but but north northwest of that is a SAM. It's really north. It's really remote. And this is where the airfields are, which then fly over the Himalayas. Let's not forget 26,000 feet and incredibly turbulent flying conditions. I mean, so it is, it, it requires immense courage just to fly that route in the planes that they've got of the day and then landing in Chanking. Yeah. And, and it's all the, the sad thing is it's all just a hand to mouth operation. That mostly what you're doing is you're sustaining your aviation assets that are within China, Chenault's Air Force, of course, and you're you're providing some help to the Chinese lend lease wise, 
but that's sort of problematic too. And they've got last priority in terms of the grand global strategy. So that, you know, we were talking earlier about how we don't, we kind of gloss over this and all this. And so, I mean, I've been as guilty as anybody until really the last 10 plus years, especially when I did the, the trilogy about the army in the Pacific and Asia, um, that, I, that I, I just thought, well, this is sort of a tertiary theater and I understand why they're trying to keep China in the war or whatever. But what I finally, in my dim-witted way, really came to, to understand is that you could argue that what's going on in China in the long view that we have today really is the most important thing in World War II for a U.S. perspective because this sort of backbenching of it leads to less U.S. influence, leads to a greater probability of the communists winning, leads to the People's Republic of China. And I think we'd all agree that China becoming communist, if it's not the most important event of the Cold War, certainly is right up there and is one of the most important events of modern times. And here we are with the People's Republic of China today. You can argue it certainly is now the most important event of the Cold War. Uh, absolutely. The, the Cold War's over and China isn't. I, I go back to Robert Harris's line. Why wouldn't you be obsessed with the Second World War? <laughs> yeah, I know. exactly. <laughs> Robert Harris is brilliant. That's a great line. And he's right. And I think in this sense, too, when you think about it, Chiang Kai-shek is constantly told by the Americans, you're really important to us. You're really, really important to us with words. And then when it comes down to actually actions uh, of providing material and troops and all that, he always seems to get last priority. And so to him, you know, it's hard for him to trust what he's hearing. And the best example is, of course, when they meet in Cairo in 1943, Chiang Kai-shek gets to, to meet as equals with the British and, and the Americans. It's a landmark moment in modern Chinese history. But everyone's obsessed with Mrs. Chiang. Absolutely. And they already were in the U.S. Oh, I could go on and on about that. It's fascinating. But um, yeah, so they, in this conference, I mean, they basically promise him some pretty major operations to go on in Burma, including amphibious ops. Uh, Operation Buccaneer, like in southern Burma and all this, the British are going to be a big part of this. And and then, of course, we meet with the Soviets at uh, Tehran subsequently, and it becomes pretty clear if we want to do this little thing called Operation Overlord, um, the invasion of France, we really can't have all these operations in Burma and whatnot because of the landing craft, so on and so forth. And so on the wake of that, after we'd made our promises to the Soviets for understandable reasons, we have to come back to Chiang Kai-shek and say, you know, with all those operations we just promised you, um, no can do. And so Stilwell has to be the conduit of that. Imagine how desirable that would be for him. Uh, and so imagine Chiang Kai-shek's reaction to it. And so he immediately is, is just, you know, completely <laughs> angry, he demands $2 billion in American aid instead. And, and that's like a non-starter with the Congress. It's just, it's very messy. Yeah. Maybe you would be grumpy if that was your job. <laughs> yeah, given, I would be if what, I were him. You know what I mean? Given <laughs> what you've sketched out there, John, maybe maybe you would be a difficult, cussed fellow to your superiors who've landed you in it and then the people around you who you can't accommodate properly. I mean, it, it's unenviable. He doesn't get on, I mean, for our British listeners, of course, he doesn't get on with erstwhile friend of the show, Archibald Wavell, everyone's favourite poetry reciting um, uh, general. <laughs> Other men's flowers. Oh, God. I mean, I, I don't really think that much of Wavell. So the fact that Stilwell might not, I'm kind of... But, you, but yeah, but you greatly admire his enormous capacity for learning large chunks of poetry. Oh, of course I do, Jim. I'm a huge fan of his ability to remember verse. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? And here's, <laughs> here's a little window into Stilwell, too, and some of the downsides to him. Uh, he was very warm-hearted in some ways, but he also he, he nursed these weird prejudices, um, some of which were self-defeating, like his hatred of the British. I mean, he's it, just had this intense hatred of the British, uh, and he, but he also didn't like cavalry. And for some reason, he thought cavalry was just ridiculous and dumb and ought to be gotten rid of. But he would say, well, the only good thing about the cavalry, at least you can eat the horses, you know. So he, he would you can imagine how someone like Jonathan Wainwright would react if he heard that, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. But he, he liked Mountbatten, didn't he? Uh, he was. Yeah, I mean, he got along with him, but I don't think he had a great opinion of him. The, the one Brit who he really liked was Slim, of course, and vice versa. That showed you how special Slim was. That he could put up with Stillwell says more about Slim than it does about Stillwell. I think it does too, yeah. and 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 of course Stillwell deeply respected Slim, and I think they worked together well. But here's the other thing too, I think, and and you know, on a bigger level, in Europe, we're at least all these nations kind of working toward the same objective in the sense of getting rid of Hitler and restoring Europe somehow. And of course, the way we're doing it, sometimes we we differ whether we have a Mediterranean strategy or go cross-channel yeah. attack, whether you go into the Balkans. Okay, that's fine. But in, in Asia, 
the countries are completely different in their strategic objectives. We know what China's situation is. Britain's main objective is to hang on to the empire. Churchill doesn't want to expend resources in Burma and all this kind of stuff. To, he couldn't care less about having a, a powerful, independent China after the war, which is what the Americans want. So we're at cross purposes here. And I think that's one of the reasons why this is so messy and why it's tougher yeah. still well to deal with that. He's sort of caught between all these factions. Does he at any point think, offer a like, comprehensive solution, or is he always just putting fires out? His comprehensive solution is to train up a really good 60 to 80 division nationalist Chinese army that'll be stocked up with the best American weaponry, excellent training in an American kind of model, and uh, ultimately regain enough territory to open up seaports, which will then take care of the supply problems and, and negate any need for the over the hump thing. It makes total sense. But the problem from Chiang Kai-shek's perspective, if he embraces that kind of meritocratic kind of American professional military approach, it's going to negate a lot of his political support in all these corrupt centers of Chinese society. So Chiang Kai-shek doesn't necessarily care about winning tactical victories over the Japanese. He cares about keeping his movement strong enough because he knows in the long run that the communists are going to be his main adversaries. And I think he understands that much better than, than do the Americans at that point in, uh, in history. And I'm talking in like 42 to 44 that era. That's amazing, isn't it? Because to think you're in a catastrophic situation thanks to the Japanese, and yet your number one enemy isn't the Japanese, it's the communists. That, that's quite a, a political pickle to find yourself in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, or, or an old school Chinese long game thinking about things <laughs> yes, in a broader so, so. in a broader sweep than in yeah. the immediate. You know, after all, the, the long term strategy has been to retreat into the Chinese inter interior because it's so vast that you can put hundreds of miles I in without really having to worry too hard about it, and still maintain a you know political coherence. And that's that's what he's doing. And he's he's forcing the Japanese into onto the wrong end of the strategic elastic, isn't he? Basically, he's. He's, he's making them stretch to reach him. And Mao, Mao does the same thing, which, which is quite clearly a thing that, that's on, if you're a Chinese strategist, that's what's on your mind. That's how you do it, because you, you do have that room in a way that a, a British strategist can't think because the Germans are across the channel. Right. <laughs> you can't think that way, and you don't have the manpower for it. And, uh, and I don't think Americans could think that way either. And that is definitely the approach. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll take a very quick break, and then we'll come back um, and find out what happens to Vinegar Joe next. Welcome back to We Have Ways to Make You Talk USA. Um, so we're, we're talking about Joseph Stillwell. So he's great. his solution, which is, which is a, a Chinese army, American-led, American tra or American-trained, American-run, American new model army for the Chinese, as it were, is obviously an impossible. He does, however, have Chinese ar army soldiers trained, doesn't he? And operates them with great effectiveness, actually, in Burma, which is the interesting thing. And of course, a thing that a you know in the British history, you get a they'll get a passing, they'll, they'll flip by in the jungle at some point, um, and, and you'll never quite encounter them properly. But he's very successful with his with his Chinese soldiers in Burma, isn't he? Yeah, so they've trained uh, at least two Chinese divisions, the 22nd and the 38th, at a place called Rumgar. And they, they're going to be put in action in early 1944, actually toward the end of 1943, and then into 44, plunging into northern Burma. The whole purpose of this is to build a road from India all the way to western China as a supply route. They've already begun that enterprise in 1943, which is an enormous undertaking, carried, and it's very diverse. I mean, you've got Indian labor. You've got British civil engineers. You've got Chinese uh, military forces, mainly as like flankers and security. And you've got U.S. Army engineers, about two thirds of whom are African-American, working on that road. Um, and then Stillwell, in this kind of crowning moment, gets a regimental size U.S. ground combat force that we call Merrill's Marauders, of course. Um, the code name at the time for it was Galahad. Uh, now, originally, our, our friend Ward Wingate thought he was going to get them and attach them to the Chindits, who had been roaming around doing much the same thing in 43, but uh, ultimately still was not going to cede control of them, and that causes tension between the two of them. And and, and he's also overseeing the Lado Road, isn't he? Exactly. I mean, that's that's the whole... So there's huge engineering projects. 
Yeah, which is an enormous and extremely difficult undertaking. And it's not ultimately completed until early 1945 that you actually have the supply route. So it takes a couple of years. Uh, and this is Stillwell's concept, and he's criticized for it. But I should also point out the Joint Chiefs and the Combined Chiefs of Staff you know, had ordered him to do this. This was their concept. So Chenault, of course, had opposed this. Stillwell ultimately gets what he wants when Chenault's concept clearly fails, the idea of winning by air power alone. And then the other thing we tend to forget in the West is the Japanese offensive Ichigo in 1944, yes. which is the biggest ground operation in Japanese history uh, and in- inflicts enormous hammer blows on the national Chinese. It, it uh, compromises the security of American airfields in China, which was something Stillwell had always said would be a problem with Chenault's concept. And I think he was right about that. You know, so you know, there's a lot of moving parts to this whole thing. The other thing I should mention, Stillwell's fortunate to make it this far because Chiang Kai-shek wanted him out in the fall of 1943 and had told Washington he, he just couldn't work with him anymore. Uh, and so... Stillwell survives, ironically enough, because uh, Chiang Kai-shek's wife, uh, Mei Ling Sung, uh, generally called, you know, Madam Shang or whatever, who is a key player in all this because she's so American on many levels. I mean, of course, she's born in China. She's Chinese, but she had spent a lot of her life in the U.S., spoke English fluently. She is the face of the nationalist regime, um, and that is gaining a lot of political support in this country and pressure on the Roosevelt government to, to help and all this. And so she was no fan of Stillwell, but the way things were shaking out in the, this sort of Byzantine power struggle in October 43, she decided we're better off with Stillwell than without him right now in terms of the American political situation. And so that's why he's able to eventually even run this campaign at all in, uh, in 1944. And, I, and I, so I would also say that relationship between Chiang Kai-shek and Stillwell is the most important Sino-American relationship in the, in the history of the two countries, I would argue, and the most tragic because um, they, they can't get on. And, and I think it's really more because of Stillwell than Chang, if we're assigning some level of blame, though plenty blame both sides. But uh, the inability to do this compromises the effectiveness of this whole operation and in retrospect helps pave the way for the communists to, to, to become strengthened, unfortunately. Yeah. So... In the end, he is relieved, isn't he? Yeah, go on. So it's recalled from China, essentially. Yeah, what happens there is that, so in, in early 1944, he runs that North Burma campaign almost as a tactical commander. Uh, he will be viciously criticized for this by some historians and some uh, of his colleagues at the time, including his successor, Albert Wiedemeyer. Is that just for being too involved on a tactical level? This is not, you, you're above this, you shouldn't be too involved. You, you know be... what, and this is this is the interesting thing for, for poor Stillwell in a way is that he's criticized from the high, by the higher ups for, for being right there in the weeds in North Burma for, for several weeks uh, during that vicious, difficult campaign in Burma. Um, but he's criticized by Merrill's marauders, the average guy on the ground for, for insensitivity, not caring about their situation, because that unit is just wrecked. You know, in the jungle by disease, fighting against the Japanese, um, they are totally used and abused. I mean, big time. And the perception of the average soldier is that still doesn't know or care. He seems to be this distant figure to them. So he kind of gets it from both sides. And I, I think with some level of unfairness, but he also has himself to blame on some levels, too, because he hasn't consummated good relationships with Shang and his retinue. And Shang, by the way, too, the other thing I should mention in fairness to him during the disastrous 1942 campaign, in which the Allies are retreating from North Burma, um, Stillwell had left on the ground with a, you know, with a small force and had walked his way back to India. And this becomes famous in America, this great trek. But to Chiang Kai-shek, he viewed Stillwell as abandoning Chinese soldiers in the field. And that was where the relationship started to, to go awry. So, you know, Stillwell has not shore up that relationship well. And then he hasn't really circulated among the combat troops to be seen uh, and tell them and explain to them, guys, here's why I can't spare you. Because, I mean, you guys know putting an infantry regiment in combat in World War II, you know about the attrition there and how quickly you're used up, how badly you need replacements or a new unit or whatever. But in the, in the, the global grand strategy, we can't send more ground combat troops to replace the Merrill's Marauders losses. We can't. This is when Normandy's about to happen and Italy's going on and all that and the Pacific. So Stillwell is then having to throw engineers at the problem 
<laughs> and claim like wounded guys and say, no, you know, if you've got a temperature below 102 uh, and you can walk, you're going back on the line. And so if you're a soldier, you view this as incredibly heartless, but it's the terrible calculus of war at that point. So by the time all this has come to a head um, and you get me at Keener, Michinar, however you want to call it in, in Burma, which is like the key place to, to help build the road the rest of the way. Uh, by that time, Chiang Kai-shek is now willing enough to swallow his dislike of Stilwell and say, you know what? All right, I'm going to let this guy control my armies for this next push in 44 and 45, but I need more Lend-Lease from the U.S. And so they're working out that deal. As that's happening, then relations just go down the tubes between Chiang and Stilwell and between Chiang and the Roosevelt government because of our frustration with how he's supposedly misusing Lend-Lease funds, not fighting, not responding to Steelwell and all that. And so Marshall persuades FDR to write this really kind of, you know, read the riot act kind of communication with Chiang Kai-shek. And Stilwell takes great pleasure in presenting it to him at a meeting in September 1944. And that's what really is the last draw for Chiang. Yeah. yeah. And so that's that's when Stilwell sent home in great secrecy because the election's coming up and we don't want the media hammering what's happened here and all that. So where does Stilwell sit with the media? Because we're talking here about his reputation with um with the people he's having to work with and and, and sort of internally and then with with soldiers. But what, how is he being what's his public face like? Because after all, mm-hmm. this is, you know, that's the sort of the third thing about a Second World War general is engaged in, isn't he? There's dealing with his men, there's dealing with the people he has to work with on the sort of strategic level. And then and then there's actually the what Time magazine says about him or Stars and Stripes, whatever. What, what, where does he sit? What's his public reputation? <laughs> well, he has a, a mixed sort of record <laughs> with the media. <laughs> right. Uh, some of them he gets on pretty well, but there are others who become almost kind of mortal enemies. And the, the, um, an example of the latter is Joe Alsop. Uh, who will become a very influential U.S. columnist, you know, in, in the long run during the Cold War. Um, Alsop became very heavily affiliated with Chenault uh, and really was sort of the one of the original authors of this kind of anti-Stillwell. Joe never had any clue about what kind of war he was fighting, and he, he aided and abetted the communists and all this kind of stuff. So Stillwell, to some people, becomes this sort of obtuse anti-communist, uh, and to other people, a kind of obtuse pro-communist. So in the media perception, he becomes whatever you want him to be right, in this okay. political football. He's not good at that, then. He's not good at giving... I think he's... I think it depends what day we're talking about, Al. He's uh, Sometimes he sometimes he is, depending on what mood he's in. He's because he's colorful, too. Um, you know, the trek out of Burma captures the, the imagination of the American media like nothing at the time and becomes this sort of weird kind of Dunkirk, mini Dunkirkish little American victory, sort of, which it's not. So you've got that, but you also have this kind of larger kind of China lobby, sort of Republicanish starting to, to sort of view Stillwell as the scapegoat kind of thing. And Wiedemeyer, who's his successor, really stokes those fires later on after the communists come to power and all that, uh, sort of blaming the mess on Stillwell, which I think is unfair. Um, I still think after all these years uh, that Barbara Tuckman's book, Stillwell and the American Experience in China, is still really the best book on, on a lot of levels, except for, of course, the work by Rana Mitter, which is amazing. But I think it's incredible when you consider when she published that, 1971, and there's still so much of it that, that holds up extremely well. Right. That's worth a look then. What I'm, I'm enjoying about this conversation, John, is we are really, we are, we're, how complicated this all is and how much he has to contend with and how much anyone would have to contend with is, you know, laying itself bare really, isn't it? That, that, that's the interesting thing. How does Wiedemeyer get on then? Well, it's also a different time when Wiedemeyer gets in and uh, Wiedemeyer is, is much more naturally attuned to diplomacy, I think you'd say, wouldn't you? You know, he's uh, it, it's move, it's still, it's <laughs> Wiedemeyer is, is such a, uh, he's such a courtier. Um, Wiedemeyer is the anti-Stillwell in that respect. So Wiedemeyer gets mm. along very well with Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, Wiedemeyer is very angry at Stillwell because Stillwell has given him no help, no instructions. He's just left theater. But you know what's interesting, guys, is that Wiedemeyer, when he comes up with his grand strategic concept and puts out all these fires and tries to keep Shang happy and all that, when you get down to his concept – 
Uh, it is almost the same thing Stillwell had proposed. Let's put together a competent Chinese army, uh, <laughs> <laughs> advised and run and help with our lend lease, and let's capture, recapture the ports. Uh, and that's what Wiedemeyer is working on in 1945 when the war ends. So, yes, Wiedemeyer does a better job diplomatically. But he achieves absolutely zip. Yeah, I mean, exactly. And it's still the same mess that's building the, the brewing civil war between the nationalists and the communists, which the Americans at first don't quite grasp. And eventually when they do become extraordinarily paranoid about it, too. You know, so that's why I say what happens in China is so consequential. Yeah, of course. It's why we end up fighting two wars on the Asian continent in, in Korea and Vietnam, you know, uh, and that's just the start of it. Oh, my God. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's amazing, isn't it? God, I mean, the tentacles of World War II. Did you get to write a memoir, John? No. So, so well, sort of yes and no. So right, it's really okay. quite tragic on some level. So Stillwell famously has a diary, uh, and he, he writes letters home to his wife, Winifred. Who, they had an incredible, very close, loving relationship, and he was very frank with her. And so Stillwell had this, this characteristic of venting his spleen to his diary and in letters to Win. Um, and so Wynn allowed a couple of uh, Stillwell's officers to kind of dress up the diaries and, and some of the correspondence. And, yes, because uh, what, what happens to him after the war? So Stillwell dies of an aggressive case of stomach cancer in 1946. So he didn't have the opportunity really to shape his legacy long term the way Wiedemeyer does. Wiedemeyer lives into his 90s um, and writes a, a memoir and, you know, all sorts of other things. But so Stillwell has a voice, but it's sort of the present tense voice of his frustrations during the war, not the latter year. I'm looking back on it and I'm shaping my reputation kind of voice. Uh, and I think that he comes across then as this sort of crotchety, venomous, narrow minded guy on some levels, if you read certain parts of his diary. But I think if we're being fair to him. You know, I, I don't I don't think really he's that guy. I, I think he's, as I've said, he's at once the best guy for this job and his love of China, his understanding of the culture and the language, but he's the worst guy in that he cannot operate in a dishonest environment. He just can't let that go and understand that you've got to look past that sometimes and think about the larger strategic objectives. Gosh, his is really quite a tragic... I hadn't, if I'd known that he died in 1946, I'd forgotten it. I mean, his is quite a tragic story, isn't it? It's yeah. a terrible story. Yeah, he had... You know, it's interesting. He had he had a reputation of being very vigorous. And of course, the trek out of Burma helps that. And, and, and you know, and there he is in 1944, enmeshed in, in a difficult situation with the troops. So he's quite vigorous on some levels and yet really hadn't taken care of himself. In retrospect, he, his health really was not good. He was uh, a pretty heavy smoker, too, and I, th I think that certainly didn't help matters. And so, yeah, I mean, all of a sudden he has stomach cancer, and it's extremely aggressive, and, and it's really quite tragic that he dies in 1946. But before that, he had uh, once he comes home after leaving China, he heads up Army Ground Forces, so like Leslie McNair's old job. Um, so he's got that job, and then he has 10th Army, uh, and so he has some important posts after leaving China, but he'll always be associated, obviously, yeah, with yeah, his yeah. time in China, I think. I mean, I'd like to come back to him, actually, because th it'd be really interesting to talk about the actual th the fighting he does in, in Burma. Well, we should do Merrill's Marauders. Uh, well, and put, well, well, but put that properly into the story of the Burma campaign, which, yeah, after, all, which after all is, yeah. you know... We we tend to tell the British version of events on on this book, or we have done on the other mm -hmm. podcast. Anyway, um, thanks very much, John. Th Jim, thanks for joining us. Eventually, I was quite enjoying having John to myself. Actually, <laughs> yeah, I know it's quite nice having that, isn't it? I mean, you know, maybe we should take it in turns. It's very very good. Um, uh, <laughs> Always better as three. Always better as three. Thanks everyone <laughs> yeah. for listening. We hope this is well. I mean, you're probably going to go off and buy the Barbara Tuckerman book now, aren't you? Is the, is the truth? Everybody? I recommend it. Um, from 1971, it's interesting that book would stand up that long, and also given how closed China was, um, exactly. you know, uh, that that must have been quite an interesting thing to sort of stick together, given you probably couldn't access Chinese opinion much I know. at the time. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, we have to go. Well, what's the point? Jim has to go. We will see you all <laughs> very soon. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Cheerio. See you.